the Lord has made and we will rejoice and we're going to be glad in it. God bless you and welcome to your divine appointment. This is the media ministry of the Divine Jackson MD Ministries. I'm Dr. Jackson and we're glad you're here for Thursday school, which is Sunday school three days early on Thursday. We're delighted to study the word of God together with you, the International Sunday School Lessons. Here we are, May the 28th of 2023, the last month, uh, the last Sunday in May in this glorious year. And today we are studying Saul of Tarsus, oh, an exciting lesson we have before us. We want you to know these recordings are available on our various social media platforms, 24 hours a day on demand. You can go back at any time and listen to Thursday school after Thursday school after Thursday school for the past few years. And will you tell others that would mean so very much to us? Help us get this information to more people. Will you do that? Friends, family, coworkers, share them a link. Show them Thursday school. Tell them how to find it. Amen. We would appreciate that. And we want you to know, in addition, we have daily postings uh, on these various platforms that are on various topics that are independent of the Sunday school lesson, just to add more information, but it's all about the sweet Savior. God bless you and we thank God for you. Lord, now your word. Find a hiding place in us. Teach us and transform us. Don't let us ever be the same again after this divine appointment. We pray it in the sweet name of Jesus. Thank God and amen. Well, Saul of Tarsus, in the book of Acts, we've been in the book of Acts this entire month. We're in chapter 9, praise God, verses 9 through 17. And we'll be reading in the King James Version and uh, looking at this glorious lesson. Well, starting with verse 9, the word of God says, And he, talking about Saul, uh, and he was three days without sight, and neither did eat or drink. Eat nor drink. Well, the uh, earlier verses of this chapter uh, set, give us the setting or the context of this passage, which is that Saul of Tarsus now has authority from the religious leaders there in Jerusalem for him to go over to uh, Damascus and all those people that are of the way, all those that have embraced Christ and saying he's Messiah. Oh, Saul is on a mission to gather them up and take them forcibly amen uh many of them are taken back to jerusalem and there they are martyred amen and so he's on this great mission he believes that it is a noble cause and this is a fulfillment jesus told his disciples people will kill you and think they're doing god a service amen so he was misled he did it ignorantly hallelujah so we can be highly motivated and sincere, but be sincerely wrong. And that's very important in this day because many people just say, just follow your heart. And if you really believe it is good, no, you can be very fervent and very convinced of a thing, but you can still be wrong. That's why we have to pursue the truth follow the truth and not follow our heart, just what we believe. The heart, the Bible says, is desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart has to be educated in terms of what's right so the heart can be pure. Now, when the heart is pure and right, now we can with fervor fulfill righteousness, but not follow just what we feel. Oh, glory to God. This is important. Amen. Saul of Tarsus, amen. Tarsus was the, the city where uh, he was from. Uh, Tarsus was uh, in Rome. Most people believe a part of Italy. Some say uh, possibly there was another area of a similar name that is in what we now call Spain. Uh, but most believe it was that area that was a part of Italy. And uh, Tarsus now was a major city, it was a university city, an area of high levels of education. And many say it was only behind Athens, Greece, which is where all the Greek philosophers, right? Uh, Plato and uh, uh, all the various uh, aristocracies and various of the uh, philosophers were from there. And so uh, uh, Athens and Alexandria 
were the only two cities that were considered to be further advanced than Tarsus, a place of high education. And here's where Saul is from. High education, culture, training, knowledge, sophistication, all of this is the environment where Saul came from. And we know he was a highly educated man. Many say that he spoke multiple languages, extremely well trained. And then when it comes to Judaism, he was trained at the foot of Gamaliel himself, a man who was one of the most highly regarded uh, teachers of the way of the Lord, uh, the way of the, the law of Moses. So Saul is somebody and uh, he is uh, uh, fervent and he is committed and he is uh, on a mission to do what he believes to be right. And while he's on that mission, he has an encounter with the Lord. Oh, blessed be God. <laughs> it's important to point out here, darling, sometimes we hear a great deal, and it's true, we hear a great deal about how we don't need uh, to have the pedigree. We don't need to be a royal blood. My father was this, my grandfather was my great grandfather. We don't have to be from famous families. We don't have to be from wealthy families. We don't have to be from educated families. We don't have to be uh, a, a, a person of fame and notoriety by this world's uh, standards. God is for everybody. Oh, that's an absolute truth. I want to add an element in there, though. Sometimes when persons perhaps have been blessed to have education, or maybe they are from a famous family, or maybe they are a person of pedigree, and maybe they are a person who has a fame or notoriety from whatever uh, a source, wealth, whatever they have. And sometimes they can feel, well, maybe that disqualifies me. Since the Lord, the gospel is preached to the poor, the gospel is for everyone. Peter and John said, silver and gold have I none. Uh, the Bible said Jesus had not where to lay his head. Jesus' focus was not on wealth and those things. And so those that may have this world's goods might feel maybe they're not God's primary choice. But the word of God is balanced because God had persons of great fame, persons of great wealth, people of high notoriety who he used as well. That's why everybody's included. Abraham was a man of incredible wealth. Bible said Job was a man that uh, was perfect and upright, hated evil, uh, but he was the greatest and the richest man in the East, in the entire region. Job was the wealthiest, but he was a worshiper. Abraham was a man of incredible wealth, but he was a worshiper. So darlings, nothing disqualifies us from following the Savior. Whatever God has put in our hands, Whatever it is, a gift, knowledge, wealth, training, pedigree, fame, opportunity, knowing people, access. Isaiah had access in and out of the uh, palace, no doubt, because he was a relative of the king. And then you have at the same time that Isaiah is prophesying in and out of the, the kingdom, not far off that time period, we've got Amos, who's out in the field. He's a, a sycamore fig raiser and a shepherd. He's got no access to the palace. What's the point? The same time God is using a blue blood, a royal blood, in and out of the palace, Isaiah to preach. Simultaneously, he's got a fig picking shepherd out in the field preaching. Everybody, everywhere, for all time, God is calling you and has a work for you. Amen. Oh, glory to God. That's good news. Wave at me if you know it's good news. Saul of Tarsus. Now, there are warnings throughout the scripture because wherever, whatever our accomplishment, whatever it may be, we can be deceived by it or we can flip and use that accomplishment to advance the kingdom. And that's what we should do. Saul of Tarsus believes himself to be right. He's on his way to basically wreak havoc in the church. And on his way, it's not in the lesson, those earlier verses, the Bible says he's on his way to Damascus. 
a great light shines from heaven. He falls to the ground and the Lord Jesus begins to speak to him. He's surrounded by an incredible light. Uh, and uh, he's like, who are you, Lord? So in a way, he's saying who he is. He's the Lord. He knows this voice and this light and this power that had me. Listen, this is God. <laughs> I'm not sure I know who you are, but I know you're God. So help me out. And Jesus says to him, I am Jesus, <laughs> whom you're persecuting. When you persecute my people, you're persecuting me. And the whole interaction. So you want to read it there in those earlier verses of this chapter. And then uh, um, he is struck with blindness. Amen. So this is incredible light. And he ends up being struck with blindness. And the people that are with him have to bring him into town. Well, the Lord Jesus tells him, go on the street called straight. And so they know where to bring him. Well, he's been brought to the home of this uh, man, Judas, there in uh, the city of uh, Damascus on the street called Straight. Many people say you got to get straight on Straight Street. <laughs> Glory to God. And he's been there three days and he's uh, blind and no food and no water, right? Nothing to eat or drink. Now, this is symbolic of him being in a period of fasting. Because fasting, right, refers to specifically uh, uh, putting away food. But here he has food nor water, and it's for three days. Now, when you look at this period of time, it's important. We don't want to miss this now. That some uh, might, might say uh, he's not eating because he's depressed. He's given up. He's hopeless. He believes it's all over. Ah, oh, quite the contrary. Certainly, he's troubled and bewildered uh, uh, by what has happened to him. But yet, hallelujah. Uh, we know that he is seeking God during this time. Um, he's seeking the face of God and believing because he knows that interaction he had on the road. Jesus has spoken unto him. Hallelujah. And he has obeyed Jesus and said, listen, I can't see, but you all take me to straight street to the place that the Lord told him to say. And he's there. And while he's there, he is focused on the Lord and seeking the Lord. We know this because while he's there, he has a vision of his deliverance. Oh, glory to God. This is important because consecration, fastings, prayer, those times are very important. What's a consecration? The word literally means to be set apart. Consecrate and sanctify mean the same thing, which is to be set apart. Apart from something, set apart unto something setting ourselves apart in particular unto God and away from our routine. So during those periods of consecration, we're not watching the things we normally would watch on television. We're not reading the things we normally read. We're not listening to the radio, the things we're normally listening to. Everything is focused on the Lord. Anything we listen to the radio, it's about the Lord. Anything we watch on television, it's about the Lord. We spend extra time in the word of God. Anything if we, uh, 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 any interaction, it's focused on the Lord. It's all about the Lord. Extra time in the house of God. Extra time in prayer, in the word, in meditation. Writing down the things the Lord is giving us to do. Searching our heart. Confessing sin. Repenting. Call people. Get things straight. Amen. Make sure that there's purity of heart. Attend to those matters to, to get our spiritual life in order. Any, so to speak, ravels hanging from our spiritual garment. Take care of those. Get everything in order. and Get our focus reset upon the Lord. That's what consecration and fasting is all about. And while in those focused in special times of seeking God, there are breakthroughs. And the apostle uh, uh, Paul, as we're to know him, Saul of Tarsus, who will soon be called the apostle Paul, is in that period. And during that time, he gets a vision. Glory to God. Oh, bless his name. Well, look at verse 10. It says, and there was a certain disciple at the Damascus, and the Lord, of course, knows that, and his name is Ananias. And to him, the Lord came to him in a vision. Glory to God. Not only is Saul having a vision, Ananias has a vision from the Lord. And, and uh, the Lord comes to, uh, he saw, uh, excuse me, verse 10, that there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, behold, what a glorious response, behold. I'm here, Lord. Glory to God. He's responding, calling him Lord. And of course, that's the same thing that Saul the Tarsus said on the road. Lord, who are you, Lord? Here, Ananias knows him and says, I'm here, Lord. Both calling him Lord. One out of a bewilderment, 
but a partial recognition of who he is. The other one's saying, Lord, out of a knowledge of walking with him. Glory to God. Uh, look at verse 11. And the Lord said to him, arise. Hallelujah. Arise and go into the street, which is called straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. Now this uh, point that the Lord's making that he's a man of prayer indicates now there's been a change. The Saul of Tarsus you've heard of, he's now a man of prayer. Glory to God. A key mark of any believer is they have a prayer life. Hallelujah. Can we say amen? All of us need a lifestyle of prayer. Prayer is high priority. Glory to God. Look at verse 12. And the Lord goes on to say, and he has seen in a vision. Well, the Lord's letting Ananias know. Saul also has had a vision. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Glory to God. Verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, <laughs> I've heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to your saints, thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind anybody that's calling on your name. Lord, I just want to mention, uh, uh, you know, you're calling me to do this. And Lord, I just want to say, uh, I need some understanding here. Uh, 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 you know, you're, you're telling me to go and lay hands on him. And I've heard all these things, Lord, so I just need clarity and reassurance, amen? And we as followers of the Lord, God's our Father. So we can say, Lord, I just wanna get clarity and make sure I've got this straight, glory to God. What at verse 15? Now verse uh, uh, 11, the Lord told him, arise and go, hallelujah. Just like we dealt with Philip in last week's lesson. Now over here in verse 15, but the Lord says unto him, go. <laughs> Great commission, glory to God. I know all those concerns you've raised, but Ananias, go your way, hallelujah. For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before he mentions three groups, the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. This is important because this is prophetic of what the ministry of what we will know him as Apostle Paul will be. Saul, many say that's his Jewish name, whereas Paul is his Gentile name. And so what happens is by uh, him using the name Paul, one, it gives a little bit of separation of the people all saying, Saul, no, Saul, oh, Saul. So he uses another name. But also uh, by using the name Paul, it identifies with Gentiles, which would be in large part the focus of his ministry. He began with the house of Israel, but then the Lord sent him uh, to the Gentiles. So the Gentiles could relate more. It's important, darlings, that we use opportunities that we have to identify with those that we're reaching, not in terms of sin, amen, because you can't be a light and be darkness at the same time. If people are in the darkness of sin and you engage in the darkness of sin, well, you got dark and dark. No, stay righteous. Be walking in the light. But yet, those things that can give identification and help people to know your compassion and care for them, that's important. So he began to use his Gentile name of Paul and, of course, uh, his title, the Apostle. Glory to God. Now, look at verse 16. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Suffering, precious ones, is part of being a soldier. And we're the soldiers of the Lord. Some say, if you're suffering, it's because you don't have enough faith. Darling, that's unbiblical. That was tested back in the time of the story of Job. Job didn't suffer because of the wickedness. There's a much broader thing. God had something he had to work in terms of the understanding of Job in terms of who God really is. But God also used it to help Job's friends come to an understanding. And of course, God bless Job's job for his trouble. So many things. And all through the scripture, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of all. There are sufferings. And Apostle Paul suffered many things. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was snake bitten. 
He went through many things, sufferings. Amen. Soldiers go through, but they're fighting a noble battle for the kingdom of God, and the reward is incredible in the end. The Apostle Paul said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Besides, after the crown of life and all the blessed crowns that will be ours, it's worth it. So suffering is not proof that a person's out of God's will. In fact, it might be the proof that they're in his will. Glory to God. How do we know the difference? Search our heart and make sure we're walking with the king. Glory to God. Well, let's pause here for our Bible spotlight. <laughs> Well, the Bible Spotlight, we praise God for continuing our uh, study of the 12 apostles. And hopefully if you have missed any of our previous studies talking about the apostles and the sons of thunder and martyrdom and all those things, hopefully you will go back and listen to those. We're continuing now to look at the second of our 12 apostles we're uh, studying, and that is the apostle John. Looked at several foundational things about him on last week and want to continue that. Well, this blessed apostle, uh, John, uh, we know that he initially was a disciple of John the Baptist, and he was called by the Lord Jesus and many other things about him. We want to look at another thing about uh, Apostle John. A unique thing is of the 12, he was the only one who was at the foot of the cross when the Lord Jesus was crucified. When they were in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Judas and the, uh, uh, all these guards came to arrest Jesus, the disciples, they fled. Hallelujah. Fear, things happened. They, they fled. But John was at the cross. We didn't see any of the other ones there. So we thank God for that courage. Sometimes, and that's a word of encouragement to us, some people are so uh, broken by their failure. They let fear overcome them and they, they just didn't come through. Darling, it happened to the 12. It happened really to the 11 because Judas was with the guards. But they recovered, and the Lord used them mightily, and we're studying them in this series. Don't let that failure be such a focus until you fail to do the ultimate thing, which is to just repent and keep going. Amen. So John had fled, but oh, here we see him at the foot of the cross. And darlings, we have to admit, uh, when a, a when, you know. By fear, they, they fled and they were disappointed. We know what Peter did. Peter ended up denying the Lord and so on. But we have to humble ourselves. That's the key. Humble ourselves and repent of it and go forward. Sometimes we have such a high opinion of ourselves till we can never get over that failure. That's sometimes because we thought too highly of ourselves to begin with and thought ourselves incapable of a failure. Oh, we have to watch pride. It's a sneaky destroyer. Glory to God. We humble ourselves, repent, and we are restored by the Lord. And so here John is at the foot of the cross. And uh, John being there now becomes uh, the caretaker for the mother of the Lord, Mary. Amen. Glory to God. And Jesus, of course, being the eldest uh, son, his job was to take care of his mother because apparently Joseph has passed away. Well, Jesus, the eldest son, fulfills his responsibility, hanging on a cross. My God, holes in his hands and suffering. John, behold, look, that's your mother. Mother, that's your son. <laughs> so he makes provision for his mother. So uh, uh, John is entrusted with the care of the mother of the Lord. And it's very important. John also is the first apostolic witness of the resurrection of the Lord. And this is important because the scripture says after the resurrection of the Lord, we, of course, the women came to the uh, tomb first and so on. But then Peter and John went to the, the tomb. The scripture says that John outran Peter. John got there first, stooped down, looked in. Now, Peter actually went in, but John was the first to be there and see he has risen. Now, very interestingly, this first went apostolic witness of the resurrection is also the one who receives the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, who is the first of those 12 to see the glorified Jesus. 
they first saw the man. We see that in the, the book of John that says, and we beheld and handled of the word of life. Glory to God. But now in his glorified state with the lamb's wool and the eyes of fire and the voice, the sound of many waters, that glorified one, John. So John sees the resurrection of the Lord Jesus in twofold. This apostle is the one. Oh, glory to God. And we bless God because these things uniquely uh, prepare John as he's the author of five books of the Bible. And we'll highlight that on next time. God bless you. Amen. Back to our lesson, Saul of Tarsus. And here we are in verse uh, 17. And Ananias went his way. He obeys. The Lord says, go. And Ananias obeyed and went. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul. This is a statement of the faith of Ananias. We need to be servants like Ananias. Even if we have reservations about what the Lord has called us to do, we seek the Lord and get clarity through that reservation. And then we obey in faith. Just like the Lord told him, he went to that house and he laid hands, just like the Lord told him, and called him Brother Saul. How much comfort and healing that had to bring to that man Saul. After all that he's done in the church and everything, the person he's seen in the vision comes, and just like the vision, Ananias comes, lays hands on him, and what happens? That his eyes are open. He says, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, hallelujah, driving home that we're talking about the Lord Jesus because he's embraced the Lord God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God uh, of the Old Testament, the Father. He's embraced him. But now we got to get to know the Son, Jesus. The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared to you in the way as you were coming here. He has sent me that you may receive your sight. And I know you're a believer now to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Saints, it is so vital that we remember as the servants of the Lord, there are some bumps in the road, but if we keep our hand in his hand, everything's going to be all right. Oh, blessed be God for this precious word of God. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for light. Thank you for life. Thank you for hope. Thank you for restoration. Thank you for renewal. Restore, renew, encourage, and strengthen my brothers, sisters, and friends today. Be strengthened in your walk with God. Whatever the failures of the past, just humble ourselves. We repent. We confess, Lord. We ask you to wash us, cleanse us, purify us, restore us, renew us. We make it right with whomever we need to make it right with, and we're going on with the Lord. If you've never made Christ your Savior, receive it now. Reject your old life. Take Jesus, the resurrected Lord, as your Savior. Follow him all the days of your life. Father, we love you, bless you, give you glory and praise until we meet again. Remember this, the God of the Bible is real. Prepare for your divine appointment with him. It is coming. God bless you till we meet again.